All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight on the Dharma Doors, we are going to continue talking about upaya, skillful means. And this, of course, is all part of a longer series that I've been doing now for a while on the Bodhisattva path. So we've been talking specifically about Mahayana Buddhism, specifically about the way of the Bodhisattva. And upaya, skillful means, is an integral part of the Bodhisattva path. And what we've been doing to explore this idea is we've been reading this sutra, the Upaya Sutra, the, the sutra on skill, skillful means or skill in means. Um, so we've been talking about this idea for a while. Um, in fact, the whole sutra is about Upaya, about the Bodhisattva's practice of skillful means. And tonight, we have a, I have a specific topic for you. What I'm calling this class is a Bodhisattva's Guide to Harmonious Relationships. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the, the theme for tonight. But specifically, as far as dharmas go, as far as, far as teachings go, we're going to be exploring a teaching called the, i uh, just show you the first part, the Samgraha Vastu. So, and these are four, by the way, but I want to, we'll talk about the four in a moment. But we're going to be talking about this idea of Samgraha Vastu. And I've talked about this idea of Samgraha or Samgraha Vastu. I've talked about it before. It's come up a few times. And every time it comes up, I kind of mention, I want to, I want to talk about that uh, for a whole night. I think it's such an interesting idea. So tonight's the night that we're going to talk about this idea. So what is the Samgraha Vastu? Well, I got to tell you that there's not a tremendous amount of information in English about this teaching. I'm hoping to produce more in English about it. But it's actually a, an essential part of the Bodhisattva path. What I mean to say is, is that because it's a topic that's not really explored in English literature on Buddhism, it doesn't really have an official translation. What you find is when it is translated, for example, I'm going to read a section, a couple of sections from our sutra tonight. And in this sutra, they translate samgraha as, um, and there's four, as I mentioned, there are four aspects to this teaching of samgraha. Our text translates it as the four inducements. <laughs> okay, so there's that word, inducement. I usually refer, refer to these as the four means of unification. There's also, what else would they call it? Uh, the four means of harmony or harmonization, which is sort of where I get the theme for tonight, the idea of creating harmonious relationships. But ultimately, well, actually, let's start this way. So last week was a fun night. I thought it was a fun Sunday night. And what we did is we talked about a parable that's in our sutra. And it's a parable called the wasteland or the marsh, depending upon the translation that you're looking at. And it was an interesting parable about samsara, about being trapped in the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And the parable was about the bodhisattva who knows how to get out of the wasteland of samsara. And rather than just 
leaving the wasteland of samsara all by themselves, the bodhisattva actually encourages people to come with them out of samsara. And the parable was an interesting one because it talked about how there was this wasteland where there were all these people living in a famine, suffering, and there was only one narrow gateway out of the, of the wasteland. And it, it, you had to walk a path that was only a foot wide. And on either side of the path were pits <laughs> thousands of miles deep. And the bodhisattva or this person is encouraging these people to get out of the wasteland, but they have to crawl along this foot wide path and there's peril on either side. <laughs> and then what we find out is that it's a parable about samsara and about the bodhisattva assisting beings out of samsara. But last week when we were reading this, there was one section and it was the monk uh, Kashyapa. Kashyapa was the one telling us this parable. And then after telling the parable, Kashyapa gives a full analysis of, you know, the marsh or the wasteland represents samsara, the person that wants to get out as a bodhisattva, the people that are following. <laughs> so it goes through all of the meaning of the parable. And then it said, this is Kashyapa telling us, and those who crawl forward along the foot-wide path following the bodhisattva, those who crawl forward are sentient beings attracted to the Buddha Dharma by bodhisattvas who use the four means of inducement or the four inducements, these samgraha vastu, the four means of unification. So that was sort of the first time that this sutra, at least the, yeah, the sutra that we're reading, that's the first time it kind of mentioned this idea of the four means of unification. And then Kashyapya finishes the parable and it, you know, finishes his explanation. And that concludes, or that concluded the first part of the sutra. Then we're kind of into this second part, and it, it, it's just a, a radical shift. It's like, okay, Kashapya, you're done. Exit stage left. <laughs> we're on to this new section. And yeah, let's, I'll read this, but it's going to build up to another section about the four means of unification. So just bear with me. And we have a few more things to talk about before we get there. So as you know, too, by the way, everybody should know there's these two different English translations of this sutra. One's from Tibetan, one's from Chinese. Since I uh, translate Chinese, I'm using the Chinese one. So what I want you to know real quickly is right now this section, and if you have the yellow book, A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras, I'm on page 442. So in this version from the Chinese, it says, then the bodhisattva, mahasattva, increasing virtue, asked the Buddha, world honored one. You say that no bodhisattva will ever perform any deed or utter any word harmful to themselves or to others. Then I have a question. <laughs> then world honored one. In a previous life, when you were a great brahmacharyan named Constellation, treading the bodhisattva path in the era of Kashyapa Buddha, with Buddhahood only one lifetime away from you. Why did you say, and this is a quote, it's very hard to attain the Bodhi path, the way of awakening. How could a bald head a, bald head, a shaved head monk, how could a bald head Kashyapya Buddha attain it? 
I don't want to see him. This Bodhisattva wants to know world honored one. What's the meaning of the words that you spoke at that time? Because it sounded like you were slandering this previous Buddha called Kashyapa. So first thing really quickly, interestingly in the Tibetan version, and this is only for people that have been coming for this whole sutra, you might remember that a couple of nights ago, a couple of Sundays ago, we were told a story about a, 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 a woman who saw a bodhisattva and was actually attracted to the bodhisattva. And because of that burning desire for the bodhisattva, this woman like, like died instantly and disintegrated. But even though she was burning with desire, which is like a bad thing, surprisingly, she was reborn in a very high heavenly realm as like a god with a whole palace and all of these, uh, uh, you know, servants and all of this. And the god wondered, how did I get reborn as a god in such a high heavenly realm? And then remembered, oh, it was because I saw Bodhisattva loving deed. <laughs> and the parable of that story was that even though this woman was burning with desire, because it was for a bodhisattva, she was actually reborn in a higher realm, not a lower realm. So that was an interesting story. But, and that uh, woman's name, by the way, was Increasing Virtue. So just a little aside, again, for people that are interested in these little, little aspects. In the Chinese version, it is that same woman turned God increasing virtue, who asks the Buddha this question about why did you say that about when you were back in that other life, why did you say that about the Buddha? It was increasing virtue who asked the question here. Interestingly, though, in the Tibetan version, it's a bodhisattva named Nyanotara, supreme wisdom, who is the bodhisattva that actually like started the whole sutra. At the very beginning of the sutra, it's Nyanotara who asks the Buddha, what is upaya? How does a bodhisattva practice upaya? So there's a bit of a discrepancy, a little bit of a discrepancy between the two versions and as far as who's asking this question. Either way, the question remains the same. And it's this question of, I've heard that in a past life, you, the Buddha, slandered, said something negative about the Bodhisattva, or sorry, the Buddha, Kashapya. Why'd you say that? Now, the Buddha replies to the Bodhisattva, and you know, either Nyanotara or increasing virtue, but the Buddha replies to the Bodhisattva, hey, don't doubt the Buddha Tathagatas or Bodhisattvas. Why? Because Buddhas and Bodhisattvas have achieved inconceivable upaya, and they abide in all kinds of upaya, all kinds of skillful means to teach and convert sentient beings. Heed my words and think well about them. There's a sutra named Upaya Paramita. There's a sutra called the Perfection of Upaya, which I shall explain to you. I also shall reveal to you a few of the upaya, the skillful means which the Bodhisattva has devised gradually since the era of Dipankara Buddha. <laughs> So now we're getting into some serious like Buddhist mythology. So if you know your Buddhist kind of larger mythology, 
you'll know that there is this whole established backstory to the life of who, who we call Siddhartha Gautama. So the Buddha, you know, like our Buddha, the historical Buddha from a couple thousand years ago. Well, that Buddha, Siddhartha, has been on the Bodhisattva path for a very long time. And there's a story about when this being who would become our Buddha, Siddhartha, there's a story about these prior Buddhas, Kashyapya Buddha, Dipankara Buddha, and there are stories, they're called Jataka tales. They are these like life stories of the Buddha, but in their, his previous lives. And one of the most famous of these is when the Buddha, our Buddha, <laughs> received the prediction of enlightenment that one day in a future life, he would become Siddhartha Gautama and eventually become Shakyamuni Buddha. And it was during, and this is kalpas ago, by the way, ages ago, eons and eons and eons ago, there was a Buddha named Dipankara, the lamp lighter. And there's a few different stories about this, but basically the Buddha, who wasn't the Buddha then, he was just a bodhisattva, he was a forest-dwelling wanderer, and he heard that a Buddha was in town. And so he ran down to the, the local village where the Buddha was about to show up, where this lamplighter Buddha was about to show up, and there was like a parade for this Buddha who was gonna come begging for food in the town. And as the Buddha approached, one of the stories is that this forest dwelling, wandering ascetic who would become the Buddha. But in that lifetime, he had um, the kind of traditional dreadlocks of a, of like a, what's called a sadhu, a, uh, one of these kind of mendicants and ascetic where they grow their hair forever and ever. And it's just this big pile of dreadlocks. So this person, this ascetic sees the Buddha coming and sees a, a like a, a puddle of mud that the Buddha, Dipankara is about to step in. And so this wandering ascetic undoes his uh, big giant pile of dreadlock hair and actually lays the hair down on the ground for the Buddha to walk over. And it was in this moment of this kind of reverence or you know reverence for the Buddha that Dipankara predicted of this person that in a future life they would become a Buddha. So that's what is being referenced here, which is that the Buddha says to the Bodhisattva, I'm going to reveal to you a few of the upaya, which the Bodhisattva has devised gradually since the time of Dipankara Buddha. Bodhisattvas. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva, meaning the Buddha before he was the Buddha, acquired the realization of the birthlessness of all dharmas as soon as he saw Dipankara Buddha. From then on, that being has never made a mistake, has never been frivolous, unmindful, or distracted, or has become unwise. Seven days after the Bodhisattva fulfilled a past vow by attaining that realization of the birthlessness of phenomena of all dharmas, that Bodhisattva could have attained supreme enlightenment right then and there. 
And if he had so desired, he could also have attained it 100 kalpas later on. For the sake of sentient beings, however, the bodhisattva was reborn many times. And wherever he was, he fulfilled all sentient beings' wishes by the power of his wisdom. Only after that did he attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment. Okay. Uh, actually, I'll read one more line and then I want to discuss that crucial idea there. So, Kulaputra, noble child, noble son. By the power of this upaya, this skillful means, the bodhisattva mahasattva has dwelled in the world for countless billions of kalpas without any worry, without any repugnance. This was the upaya practiced by the bodhisattva mahasattva. Okay, so we're not quite at the four uh, means of unification just yet, but I just want to discuss sort of like kind of what's going on. So we, we actually, we're not going to get an answer to the Bodhisattva's question. So this question about, all right, so back in the day, you said this seemingly slanderous thing about a Buddha. Why'd you do that? We're not going to actually find out why the Buddha did that for a, actually quite a while, like many, 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 many pages. We probably will not get there tonight. So I'm just going to leave that hanging out there. But the idea, though, is, is that the Bodhisattva who asked this question is basically asking this question of like, but it, it seemed like you said this negative slanderous thing against the, the Buddha, but you've also just said that bodhisattvas don't say negative harmful things about people. So how, do, how does that work? And so what we heard was, is well, the first thing you need to know is that after the Buddha received the prediction of enlightenment from Dipankara Buddha way back in the day. At, after that, the Buddha was incapable of making any mistakes, incapable of being unwise. So that's the first thing you need to know, Bodhisattva, like going into this, all right? And then what we hear, though, is about this idea that as soon as as soon as the bodhisattva, and they're, by the way, when they say the bodhisattva, they are referring to the Buddha before he was the Buddha. And the idea is, is that before or after the, that Buddha received or attained this realization of the birthlessness of all phenomena, from that moment on, it said that the, the, that the bodhisattva could have entered ultimate enlightenment right then or if they had chosen to they could do it in a hundred kalpas but the point is that after the realization of the patient tolerance of the birthlessness of all phenomena a bodhisattva could whoop go right into nirvana go right into ultimate enlightenment or they could do it next week or in a month or in a year, or in a kalpa, or a hundred kalpas, the point being is that it is now entirely within the bodhisattva's control to reach full enlightenment at any point. It is only out of compassion for all beings that the bodhisattva keeps coming back into the world. So that's a common theme that we've sort of been talking a lot about, but I want to talk more about it tonight. And it's this idea, you know, it's this idea that gets, it gets spoken about as 
you know, when people, I know that like when I was in uh, undergraduate and I was first learning Buddhism and I was first learning about the Bodhisattva version of Buddhism versus like the earlier form of Buddhism, I know that what I learned was a kind of cliche idea that the Bodhisattva gets right up to the edge of like nirvana and enlightenment. And I, f I feel like I even had a professor that put it this way because I have such an image in my mind, but it's the idea that the Bodhisattva gets right up to the edge of enlightenment and nirvana, sort of like peeks over that edge a little bit, but then says, you know what? I'm not going to go into full nirvana until all sentient beings have gone to nirvana and there's nobody left then i'll go in <laughs> that's how i heard the idea of the bodhisattva and you know there's a way in which that works that's cool that's a fine kind of image to have in mind but it's a little um there's a few things that are missing in that and what's missing in that of course is this idea of well it's a twofold idea actually and what it is, is it's, it's this twofold idea about a bodhisattva is a very wise person, so wise, in fact, that they could just attain nirvana or enlightenment. So their wisdom is very high in that way. And there's a way in which, of course, the early form of Buddhism, what would be called the Hinayana, there's a way in which that's what, that's supposedly what the Buddha taught. That's supposedly what we're supposed to do is develop wisdom, develop skills in meditation, and reach nirvana, reach enlightenment. What's different in the Bodhisattva path, though, is that the, the Bodhisattva develops all the skills and all the wisdom of the early tradition, but what makes the Mahayana tradition Mahayana, what makes a Bodhisattva a Bodhisattva, is this understanding that to be liberated alone is to not be liberated. It's a form of liberation, but it's not actually full, complete enlightenment or liberation. And I won't get too into it. There's a lot of actually like very interesting kind of philosophical Dharma type stuff that re you can really begin to understand why it makes sense that individual enlightenment is is uh it doesn't make any sense it's like a non sequitur it just isn't is not it doesn't compute from a certain point of view the idea of just one person being liberated so but what i mean to say though is that the bodhisattva is super wise and super skilled in that way and could go the route of an arhat but chooses not to go the route of an arahat and become fully enlightened and in nirvana, but rather chooses to keep coming back into samsara. Now, a, one couple of things about that idea of the bodhisattva willingly coming back into samsara. I'm going to give you two ways that you can think about that. There are many, many ways to think about it, but here's just going to be two different ways to think about that idea that we just heard about, about the Bodhisattva continuing to come back into the realm of suffering or back into samsara, back into cyclical existence. So the one way to understand it, and I'm going to give you the, the more like textbook, mainstream, explanation of this idea. So the basic idea is you, you kind of have to be thinking 
a little bit in terms of reincarnation. So we, we're talking about samsara. We're talking about the idea of death and rebirth and then life, death and rebirth and this kind of cyclical existence. And the idea, of course, and, you know, this is complicated again. So I'm going to give you a very simple explanation of it. For most sentient beings, the idea, the Buddhist idea of reincarnation is that most creatures, most sentient beings have conditional, conditioned habits, lots of them, <laughs> physical habits, vocal speech habits, and mental habits. And, you know, one, one idea or one example just to, to get us thinking in the right way, it has to do with a kind of an illusion, a certain illusion of free will. And what that illusion of free will is, is it's the idea that when I choose something, when I decide something, there's this idea that I did it of my own free will. It's this idea of like, um, so, you know, like, so tonight, this evening, just a, an hour or so ago, uh, I had my evening meal, I had tofu. <laughs> and the idea is, is that I want to feel like I made the choice like that there were a bunch of different things that I could have eaten, but I decided, you know what? I'm going to have tofu tonight. But if you really investigate that, or if I were to investigate that, I'd have to actually recognize that there's a way in which that decision was a conditioned response. And the idea, of course, is, is that the reality is, especially in my refrigerator, in my refrigerator right now, I maybe had three or four options for dinner. <laughs> so that limits things immediately right there, <laughs> that I didn't actually have an inf infinite number of selections. It was really limited. And then within those three or four options, there's cooking times involved. There's, I'm going to be teaching. So, you know, I might want to eat something light if I'm going to be teaching soon. And pretty soon I realize that the choice I made was utterly habitual and conditioned. It had the appearance of a free choice, but ultimately it actually wasn't. It was very conditioned in that way. So part of the teachings, not the entirety of them, but part of the teachings of Buddhism are about samskara. It's one of those five aggregates of the self, which are, what, it, what are you? <laughs> you are your habits. <laughs> That's a big chunk of what makes you, you is your habits in that way. So now we have this idea that there could be the illusion of freedom, free will and choice. But if you look deeper, you'll kind of notice that a lot of, if not all of the things that we do are conditioned and habitual. What this means from a Buddhist point of view regarding reincarnation, is that we are presently in a state of deep conditioning. And then in that state of deep conditioning, I make choices that then reinforce that state of conditioning. And then I do it again and I do it again. And it's a constant reinforcing of my conditioned habits. All every time I double down on those habits, I, I make the habits deeper, I make the grooves deeper in that way. So 
from Buddhist point of view, the idea is, is that your future rebirth, like whether you will be reborn as a human or maybe come back as an animal or come back as a god in a heavenly realm or come back as a hell dweller, from a Buddhist point of view, our rebirth is determined by our conditioned habits. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, is that from a, ba a certain basic Buddhist point of view, your rebirth, you are, you're setting up the conditions for your rebirth right now <laughs> with the way in which you're conditioned. And as you continue to condition yourself in that way, you, this is the, you know, again, this is super overgeneralized. But the general sense is, is that then those habits and those conditions are going to propel you into your next rebirth, and you will not have a choice about it. You will be sort of at the mercy of your past conditioning at that point. So that's a normal uh, being, a normal sentient being trapped in samsara. The reason why, from a Buddhist point of view, the reason why they're trapped is because of their conditioning. Now, one of the things that I would kind of want to make clear, and I'm, I'm risking a huge digression here, but I'm going to try to hold on to, to the, my train of thought. Really quickly, there is a, a very helpful, very useful, Buddhist analogy for reincarnation. And what that analogy is, is that it, it talks about thinking of your body as like a candle. You're made of wax. You are a candle. And what the Buddhists talk about is the, the flame, the flame of this candle is desire craving we are burning with the flame of craving the buddhist analogy for reincarnation and this if anybody's out there who's and you know i get this question a lot which is like don't don't the buddhist talk about how there's no self then how is there reincarnation if there's no self this is the classic buddhist answer to that question it's like you're a candle burning with the flame of desire. And there is in a womb, a new wax candle being formed. An embryo in a womb is a new wax candle being formed. And as the organs form and as the, the fetus forms into a baby, it's forming into a wax candle, but it doesn't have any flame. And so the easy description of reincarnation in Buddhism is that you're over here burning with the flame of desire. You burn up all the wax of your candle life body. And then reincarnation is about you and your flame of desire transferring the flame and igniting a new life with the flame, with your, the conditioned habits of the flame of your desire. And what I want you to think about is how if I, if I literally had two candles here, one was lit and one was not lit. If I lit this second candle, this candle flame that came from the original candle flame, this candle flame cannot be said to be the same flame as the original flame, but it's not distinct from it either. <laughs> it has a direct relationship to that original flame, but it's not that original flame. It's a new flame, but it inherits it inherits the flame of desire from the previous life. 
So in other words, what is continuing on through the process of reincarnation in Buddhism is the desire, not a soul, not an essence, not a self, not, you know, an Atman or anything like that. It's just the desire that then gets transferred. And then the idea is, is that that new candle flame that it was inherited from you burns throughout its life and then passes the flame to a new candle. And then that life goes on. And so you have this process of the reincarnating of the flame of desire without there being an essential being there that is going through this process. The reason why I wanted to tell you that is because in the early form of Buddhism, like the Hinayana, the goal was putting out the flame of desire. And then you know what happens when you put out the flame of desire? No more rebirth. There's nothing to continue on because I have squelched or put out the flame of desire that would be what is perpetuating the process. The point that I'm making about this is that an arahat who is in the early Buddhist tradition and an arahat has successfully put out the flame of desire and greed and ignorance, but I'm just kind of focusing on the basic idea of desire. And because an arhat has put out the flame of desire, they're done. The work is done. This is a common Buddhist phrase in the early Pali Canon. It's the idea that the work is done. And so the arhat is in a state of nirvana. What is nirvana? Nirvana means blown out. That's what nirvana means, to blow out the flame of desire. And therefore, there's no more reincarnation, no more rebirth. Now, you may know that in the world of Buddhism, they make a distinction between nirvana and parinirvana, final nirvana. What they call, and this is an important phrase, they call final nirvana the nirvana without remainder which means the regular nirvana like of a, an arahat is with remainder well what remains what are they talking about well the idea is is that if if you're following my candle analogy an arahat puts out the flame of desire is now in nirvana and therefore isn't going to be reincarnated but they're still alive. They are still embodied. They still have the wax. And so the idea is, is that an arhat will live out the rest of quote unquote their life and then enter parinirvana because there will be nothing left because even then the body is gone. But until then, when they are still walking around, begging for food, meditating and doing all the activities of life, they are in nirvana, but there is nirvana with remainder, the remainder of the body. I'm going through all of this, by the way, for one reason, only one reason. It's actually to point out that from the, this kind of... Um, I don't know what you would call it, cosmology, I suppose, but from the cosmology that I just laid out, an arahat who has put out the flame of desire, yeah, they will not be reborn, but what we are finding out tonight that is of interest is that an arahat can't be reborn. They don't have the flame of desire that would then move on. So they have cut off any chance of getting reincarnated. Now, 
from an earlier Buddhist point of view, why would you want to come back to samsara? Why would you want, you wouldn't want that flame of desire to continue because you wouldn't want to come back here. But that's what makes the Bodhisattva path different. The Bodhisattva has made a vow, a vow to awaken all sentient beings. This is a group effort for the Bodhisattva. So there's a way in which the Bodhisattva needs to keep coming back. And so, and this is going to get really interesting and subtle. And so the Bodhisattva, and, and I wouldn't tell you this if I couldn't back this up with lots and lots of sutras and lots and lots of commentary. But what's really interesting is that they talk about the Bodhisattva making this vow to awaken and liberate all sentient beings. And it's a subtle form of desire. Like want, wanting to do that, wanting to help everybody is still a form of desire. And it's what keeps the flame burning for a bodhisattva. But that's the bodhisattva's ticket to coming back and coming back again and coming back again and coming back until the vow has been completed. So now what we're talking about, and I, by the way, I'm still only in my first example of this, which is the literal straightforward understanding of this as reincarnation, like literally about birth and death and rebirth and how it is that an arhat cuts themselves off from that cycle, a bodhisattva stays in that cycle, but here is a very interesting thing about it. Remember I was telling you a little while ago that a normal person, so not an arhat, not a bodhisattva, but a regular old person, remember when I was saying that a normal person is at the mercy of their conditioning and so their future rebirth is going to be like, like my dinner tonight. I'm not going to have a choice. It's going to sort of just be a conditioned thing that happens to me. Well, for most people, again, re the rebirthing process is, it's just our karma playing out, our conditioning playing out in that way. Again, an arhat who's cleared all of that conditioning up They've put out the flame, so they're not going to go through it. A bodhisattva, as I was saying a while ago now, a bodhisattva is as just as accomplished as an arhat. And so they could at any moment push, squelch the flame of desire and whoop, go to nirvana, final nirvana, ultimate enlightenment. So they're as, as wise in, as an arhat, but They've made this interest, it's like a loophole, like a loophole in the Dharma, where it's like, oh, but if I make this vow to save all sentient beings, I have a little desire left, and that desire will allow me to get reborn. But here's the thing about a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva can have whatever they want for dinner. And what I mean is, is, what they talk about is a bodhisattva who is not subject to the wave or the tsunami of their past conditioning. A bodhisattva who is not subject to that has actual free will to choose wherever they would like to be reborn. They are not just determined by their past life in that way. They are free agents in the bardo in this ethereal realm between lives. And ultimately what they talk about is that the bodhisattva in the form of a Gandharava, which is the form one takes when you're traversing the bardo. And I know some of you may not have heard these terms. I'm just saying them for those who have, but there is this tradition within Buddhism that talks about a space between lives. It's the bardo. And the idea is, is that in that bardo, the bodhisattva can basically decide, you know what, that, that womb down there, 
that has a baby that's being created and gestated, that would be the best place for me to be reborn. I could help the most amount of people if I was in that body. And so the Bodhisattva gets to willingly choose their reincarnation rather than being subject to their past karma or rather than being like an arhat who has opted out of the whole process altogether. Okay, I've been talking for too long. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about what's been going on? Yeah, there's a lot. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Michael. That was awesome. Always that, awesome. I, that really made a lot of sense. I've been thinking a lot about reincarnation, uh, but I'm wondering when and why does a bodhisattva decide to be a Buddha? And what about Buddhas? Like, they don't get reincarnated again, but the world's not done being, you know, uh, liberated. So why do they just be like, you know, like Siddhartha Gautama, he just like became a Buddha and then died. Like, what's up with that? So I, I'm not going to answer the second part of that. And the only reason why I'm not going to answer the second part is that the entire rest of this sutra is about that actual question. It's actually about, wait a minute, if the Buddha could have just stayed around forever and saved us all, why did he check out early? That's going to be the question about what was the upaya of that. Now, the first part of your question about, in general, a bodhisattva's transition to Buddhahood, that gets very complicated. Um, it, it, it's interesting though. So I'll tell you this about it though, because, because I already introduced an aspect of it. So I mentioned what, what I called, uh, what did I call it? The, the little Dharma loophole and that, that idea that this, the Bodhisattva makes the vow, which is a form of desire. Now, it's altruistic, it's noble, it's righteous, it's pure, but nonetheless, it's still a desire. And that desire is what propels the bodhisattva or allows the bodhisattva to keep coming back. What they actually talk about is as the bodhisattva continues to progress, as they get closer to Buddhahood, what they actually talk about happening is, and it's complicated, but they basically talk about that, that the desire to help everybody, even that desire is eventually, uh, is uh, relinquished. Mm -hmm. And then when the Bodhisattva actually has relinquished all desire, that's when they boop, become a Buddha, because that's a, a defining characteristic of a Buddha is that kind of uh, total uh, dissolution of desire in that way. But what I want to tell you about this, and by the way, I think all of these questions are interesting, but they have their limit of their usefulness in that way, because I'm nowhere near a Buddha. So this is all theoretical, truly. But the, the path, as I have learned the path, the path to Buddhahood is one of the exertion of great effort, great virya, great determination is required to tread the bodhisattva path. So great effort is required. But what they talk about is that the bodhisattva reaches a certain stage of development in which so many of the past conditionings and the past habits and the past defilements, so much and so many of them are gone that at a certain point, the bodhisattva practice, it becomes, and they call it, effortless. It's, it's a moment when the bodhisattva is on pure cruise control. They couldn't do anything but. <laughs> be kind, help out, uh, strive for enlightenment. Like they just, they couldn't do anything but that. So they are on effortless 
autopilot. And it's from that state of being effortless in one's practice that then eventually even the subtle desire of wanting to help everybody fades away. And then one is in absolute equanimity, equipoise, and Buddhahood. So, but again, it's all theoretical from my point of view. Yeah, Noe. I love theoretics. <laughs> so, for me, it begs the question, in my previous life, was I moved, was, was the Bodhisattva in my previous life, which has arrived at this moment in my life, to seek out and to make effort and to relinquish, you know, the desires, not like all of them, but you know what, uh, I, at 69 years old, or maybe sooner, it was just like, um, I want to, I want to do this. Is that from my previous Bodhisattva life? <laughs> I will tell you from, from having had the honor and pleasure of spending a lot of time in Buddhist communities, like in East Asia, living in monasteries, being among deep practitioners within the world of Buddhism, Noe, I can tell you that the, the, the very, very agreed upon and accepted understanding is that anybody in this life if anybody is attracted to the Dharma, it is definitely from something that has happened in a prior life. That is, uh, that's any, but any monk, any nun, any, you know, Buddhist in East Asia or Asia that you talk to, if they found out you were into Buddhism, the, the determination would be, yep, oh, it's from a past life. So, yeah. All right. I have one more thing to mention, unless there's any more questions about general reincarnation ideas that I was just mentioning. Okay, then let me give you the second way to understand it. So if you're not into reincarnation, if all the reincarnation stuff is like, if, if you're kind of like, wait, that's why I got into Buddhism is I wanted to get away from all that mumbo jumbo. Fine, you can totally do Buddhism without reincarnation. The way that I would interpret this same exact teaching that I just talked about, but without reincarnation. So you take something, uh, and I've used this example in the past. It's kind of, I don't know, it's a, it's a mediocre example, but I haven't found a better one yet. But the example would be, as you all know, within Buddhism, there is a precept against um uh, consuming alcohol. So there is a precept about inebriation. And ultimately, within the early form of Buddhism, um, it, intoxicants, alcohol, is impure. It's an it's a unwholesome thing. It's an unwholesome dharma. So you don't want to go anywhere near it if you're in the early Buddhist, and the precept is about not taking alcohol, not consuming it. But the idea is, is that I want to kind of then look at it as far as the, the habitual desire to inebriate oneself, right? If, if anybody, you know, I, you know, I think I've talked about this in the past. I, I, I don't know if I would have called myself an alcoholic in that way. These things are hard to self-diagnose in that sense. But I definitely, since I have stopped drinking, look back on my behaviors when I was drinking and sort of, you know, some of them were questionable, let's put it that way, as far as how much, when, all of that. So the idea is, is that a one way of thinking about what I was just talking about is that the desire to inebriate oneself, although we could think of it as an act of free will, there it is again, it's that idea of like, well, I could or I couldn't 
do I want to? Do I not want to? Of course I want to, is the way a normal person would think if they are a drinker in that way. It's like, yeah, I want to. And then it's free will. But if you look at it, you reflect on it, the realization is no, we are conditioning ourselves. And again, I speak from somebody who's been through it. We condition ourselves to equate a good time with being inebriated. And then we become conditioned into that way of thinking so that an evening not being inebriated isn't fun, isn't pleasurable. <laughs> so we condition ourselves into those modes of behavior where this is fun, that's not fun. Now, what do you want to do tonight? You want to have fun or not have fun? <laughs> And you begin to notice again where it's like, well, obviously I want to have fun. So it's these conditioned behaviors in that way. And so I think um, consuming alcohol is a great example of a conditioned behavior that is very difficult to un or decondition oneself from. And the idea is, is that if you were an arhat, if you were in the early Buddhist tradition, you, of course, take a vow, take the precept to not get in, uh, inebriated. And then, of course, you may still have the desire to consume alcohol. And that means you're not an arhat yet. But you're, if you're not consuming it, then you've taken the vow, you've made a precept. But if you still desire it, then you still have conditioning to work on in that sense. What makes an arhat an arhat, what makes that state of nirvana, that state of nirvana is it's when you have actually cleared out all of that conditioned desire to the, to the point where you really, really don't want it anymore. And of course, I'm not just talking about alcohol. I'm talking about any form of craving, any form of desire, conditioned and all of that. But if you go back to what I was talking about in terms of nirvana, the idea is the same. It's about clearing out that conditioned behavior of equating inebriation and a good time and realizing, you know what? You could have a good time instantly anytime you would like. If you're free, if you're liberated, but if you're conditioned to only, you know, oh, I know I need this or I need that to be happy. If you've conditioned yourself to need certain things in order to be happy, what you've done is conditioned yourself to not be happy other times. Whereas if you could clear out all that behavior, you could be happy when you would like to be happy. It, it would actually function like that. Now, the point is though, is that an arhat again is totally cleared out of all of this behavior. In the early Buddhist point of view, from the Hinayana, a monk, a nun, an arhat, all of these people that are pure beings who have totally eradicated all their conditioned behaviors in that way, they would never go anywhere near a bar. A bar is a defiled place. It's full of defiled people getting defiled. There's nothing there. And so an arhat, whoop, isn't, again, isn't going to go anywhere near a bar. So if we're not going to talk about reincarnation, which again, we don't need to talk about, then a way of thinking about the, a bodhisattva who has accomplished the same kind of free state or liberated state as an arhat but who chooses to go back into samsara? Well, another way you can think about that is a bodhisattva who doesn't, is cleared out of the conditioned behavior of inebriation and needing inebriation, but feels compassion for those who are still stuck in such a rut or stuck in such conditioning. And so a bodhisattva would not consider it a defiling thing 
to go hang out in a bar and maybe try to, you know, not be, you know, an evangelical preacher, but, you know, just try to help people out in that way. How, you know, if um, I've even been in situations since, since I kind of stopped drinking where it was sort of about being in a bar with a friend and kind of being like, you sure you need, you sure you need another one? Versus the older me would have been like another round, <laughs> another round right here. But the bodhisattva me who's going, trying to be going back into the realms and try to help people is sort of about compassion, looking out for people. But again, I'm not avoiding these places and calling them bad in that way, but it's about compassion for all beings. So that would be an example of a bodhisattva going, quote, back into the realm of desire, but out of compassion for all beings, right? Okay, any questions about that more practical version of the Bodhisattva path? Does that sound okay? Okay, now, what would the Bodhisattva do in the bar? <laughs> How would they do this? So all night now for well over an hour, I've been talking about this Bodhisattva employing upaya, employing skillful means to, quote, save all sentient beings or liberate or awaken all beings and all of that. Well, how would they do that? Well, there are four ways that a bodhisattva can do that. And those again are called the samgraha vastu, the, the, the vastu, the things, the things that unify or the things that bring harmony. And again, they are four in number, and they are giving, kind speech, volunteerism, and cooperation. So those are the Sanskrit words. These are the English translations, and those are the four means of unification. And so I want to go through those in our remaining time. I want to go through those. I want to, you know, talk about each of them a little bit in, in depth, but I also want to mention this as, as like a context for what I'm about to say. So I would like to discuss these four samgraha, these four means of unification. I'd like to talk about them in a very particular way. And what it is, is, is I want to talk about it in terms of relationships. So as most of you know, or have noticed, I am married and I'm very happily married. And I was thinking, I've been thinking a lot lately about these four means of unification as really, really, really good marital advice, <laughs> like how to have a healthy, happy, harmonious relationship with another person. But I've also taught these, by the way, not to limit it to a uh, relationship in that way. I've also taught these four things to students, uh, more uh, kind of my private students, but students that work with uh, teams. They're like either team builders or they work in offices in which they're involved in managing groups of people. And we have used or talked about using these four things as the means to create harmony among uh, groups. So you can think about these as four ways of bringing harmony between just two people in a relationship, between a group of people working together, even in an office. But where these are usually talked about is about bringing unification to the Sangha. So bringing unification to the group of Dharma practitioners in that way. And so what they talk about is the Bodhisattva going in to situations in which there is division, 
situation in which there are factions or schisms and all of that, and using these four means to bring harmony to the group. Or again, we can think about it in a relationship. So the first of these is dana, giving. And I know that you know that dana is also the first paramita. It's the first initial practice of a bodhisattva, being generous, uh, giving. Now, when we talk about dana as a paramita, as a practice, we are usually talking about giving food, giving clothing, giving medicine, giving shelter. Those are sort of the normal things one thinks of when one thinks of dana, of generosity. But when we're talking about the samgraha, when we're talking about these four means of unification, I want you to know that the giving has a slightly different connotation to it than it normally does. And what it is, is, is that within the framework of these four, dana is about, about giving that which would make people happy. And when you read sutras that talk about the bodhisattva path, and they talk about the four means of unification, what they are very, very clear about is that giving something like money or like an object, yeah, like you could do that. And if that's what would make the person happy, then yeah, go ahead and do that. But other things like attention is a far more kind of valuable thing to give in a way. Giving the Dharma, oh my gosh, that's like the, the highest thing that you could give someone is wisdom or teachings in that way. So there, in other words, within the framework of the four means of unification, it's very much about a, what I would call a disposition of generosity. It's a disposition of giving, and it's about being ready to give whatever is necessary. It might be time. It, again, it might be attention. It might be stuff. It might be, oh, it might be humor. That might be a big one that you could give someone is a smile and, and uh, you know, a, a joke or something. So in, within the framework of the samgraha, giving or being generous is so subtle. And the bodhisattva is deep about always being generous and being very mindful of when they're not being generous. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of the first aspect of the four means of unification is being generous or giving, but it's always with the intention of, of I, and I don't want this to sound trite, of this idea of making people happy. It's, it's, it's not trite in that way. It's, it's actually about, um, well, again, if we think about it in terms of a relationship, the idea is, is that if you're in a relationship with someone like I am, if one of the people or both of the people are being not generous, <laughs> if one of the persons or both are withholding, right? And withholding a lot, not just, you know, maybe, um, you know, hiding things, you know, maybe it's, a, again, like not sharing, but hiding things so that they don't find them kind of a thing that's not being generous and giving, that's kind of being very concealing and like that. So generosity in a relationship is key 
because the opposite of generosity is what undoes the relationship in that sense. So the Bodhisattva is very aware of the role of generosity in creating harmony. And again, mainly it's because of realizing the detriment of the opposite of being generous in that way. All right. Next up is Priya Vachana. Priya Vachana. So kind speech. But actually, Priya, it's not even so much about kind speech as pleasing speech. Again, the emphasis is on making people happy in that way. And so this kind of speech is, is this sort of uh, pleasant speech. But I do want to focus on the idea of just calling this priyavachana. I want to focus on calling it kind speech because I would, I, I would love to share something with you all. This, this just sort of dawned on me when I was thinking about the word kind. So I've been married for a while now. And I remember my, I have a very good dear friend of mine, old friend, we, we've been friends since we were very young. And he got married, boy, he got married uh, many years before I did. Um, so he got married kind of earlier in life. I got married a little bit later in life. And I still remember to this day, it's one of those things. And again, I want to share it with you. It's so important to me. I still remember at my wedding, it was before the ceremony. It was the day of the wedding. It was before the ceremony. And I remember my wife and I, or, or my wife-to-be and I, we were talking to my friend who had been married for a while. And we asked him, so, like, do you have any advice for us, like, going into this uh, marriage together? Because you've been married for a while. Like, do you have any advice? And I'll, again, I'll never forget what he said. And my, my wife and I, we mention it a lot. My friend said, be kind to each other. And it was one of those things that it hit us both like, a, like, wow, like it's deep. It's really profound. The idea of being kind to one another. And, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to pretend. I know that relationships can be hard. They can be difficult. They can be strenuous. They can often kind of bring out the worst in us, especially if there's an argument or a fight. And so, but it's just about recognizing how far kindness can go. It It's kind of, it has really, I feel like what, that little, little piece of advice about being kind to each other. I really think it's what has allowed my wife and I to have such a great relationship all these many years later is always going back to that piece of advice. So, and of course, being kind to each other begins with kind speech in that way. And so one of the things that I would want to say regarding the Bodhisattva path is a Bodhisattva is very, very mindful of how their behavior and how their words are affecting other people. You know, I say this a lot about, you know, the Buddhists are really, really focused on speech. You know, they'll talk about avoiding killing, of course, avoiding stealing, of course of avoiding intoxicants and all of that. But when it comes to speech, oh my gosh, it's not just about avoiding false speech. It's about avoiding malicious speech, harsh speech, idle speech. Uh, they go down the list of all the different ways that we can abuse, abuse in a way, language. And I say this a lot when I get to talking about speech, like as you know, one of the Noble Eightfold Path, right speech. The idea is, is I, the, the example that I give a lot is 
how powerful our words are in the way in which our words could really like make or break somebody's day. You pay somebody a compliment in the morning. You, if I say to my wife in the morning, wow, you look great. All day she could be in a good mood. But if I say some stupid, mean, unkind thing in the morning, we could be kind of in a low grade argument all day. It could just be not good all day from just one word. Speech is that powerful. And so I think a big part of the Bodhisattva path, a big part of the Bodhisattva practice is to always be mindful of what we're saying, but in particular, how it's going to be received. And really asking, I know I do this a lot. I really, I spend a lot of my meditative time, I mean, in practice, but I spend a lot of my time like asking myself, is this necessary? To say, is it really necessary to say this? What am I really actually trying to, to accomplish by saying this? And in particular, it's about when critical things are going to come out of my mouth, like criticizing or complaining or th anything like that. And it's sort of like, what, what's exactly going on here? Am I just trying to like share my misery? in that way? Or if I'm a bodhisattva, am I trying to use my words for the benefit of others? So that's a little bit about priya vachana, uh, pleasant speech or kind speech. Um, next up is arthakritya. Arthakritya is translated a bunch of different ways, but I like to translate it as volunteerism. The word arthakritya, it's very much about helping others with their endeavors. That sounds like volunteerism to me. So it's a kind of a decent translation. But if I were going to put this into the context of a relationship, volunteerism is about, for me personally, the way that I practice this, volunteerism is really about in helping and encouraging, say, for example, my wife, helping and encouraging her with her projects, with like what she's involved in. And the point is, is that they, the success or the failure of that project, it doesn't have to do with me. Like it's something that she's involved in. And there's a way in which I could be stingy with my time. I could be stingy with my attention and I could be stingy with kind of my effort. And I could be like, well, you know, if that's what she wants to do, then she's got to do it. <laughs> right. And it could be this very like, that's on you. I'll be over here working on my project. <laughs> and there's a way in which just noticing that that mentality of like, good luck with that. <laughs> I'll be over here. That's probably a way to start to create division within the relationship versus a kind of volunteerism of putting oneself to the side and stepping up to help the other with their whatever they're working on. So that's the idea of arthakritya. And then the fourth means of unification is this some Samana Arthata, Samana Arthata, cooperation. Cooperation is when it's both of our project together, and we're going to be working on it together. Now, my wife and I, we don't have children, but I would imagine that in a cup, in a, in a relationship where there are children, that's going to require a great deal of cooperation. That is a joint endeavor. And I have seen it so many times, relationships dissolve and break up because there wasn't that cooperation. 
all of the responsibility was being put on one person or the other, that builds up resentment and that creates division. Whereas both parties stepping up to cooperate and work on things together is key to the success of a relationship. Now, you put all four of those together in a relationship where both people are being generous, kind with their speech, volunteering to help each other and cooperating. That's a harmonious relationship. So, um, and again, it doesn't just need to be in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. It could be in any kind of group relationship where these are the values. Basically, it's funny. I just thought of this. These four means of unification that we're talking about, this is the makings of a bodhisattva mission statement. <laughs> like <laughs> so anybody who's you know done nonprofit organizations or whatever, and you had to come up with a mission statement, this is the bodhisattva mission statement. It's about giving kind speech, cooperation, and volunteerism. That those are the our four uh, our four points of our mission statement. So, okay. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas? Awesome. Let me just read to you this then. So I didn't actually finish the reading for tonight. So, but I've I've set it all up. So, the Buddha, in telling the Bodhisattva about Upaya, the Buddha says, furthermore, if a Shravaka, which is to say an old school monk from the Hinayana, if a Shravaka entered one of the Dhyanas or Samadhi meditation states, of the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, they would become unmoved in body and mind and think that they had already arrived at Nirvana. However, when Bodhisattvas enter dhyana or samadhi meditations, they become vigorous in body and mind instead of being indolent. They attract sentient beings into their following by the four means of unification. Out of great kindness and great compassion, they teach and convert sentient beings by means of the six paramitas. This was or is the upaya practiced by bodhisattva mahasattvas. And so that's just sort of kind of encapsulates a lot of the ideas I was talking about tonight. And again, one of the critiques of by the Mahayana regarding the earlier path is that the monks and the nuns and all of those deep meditators, they become indolent, meaning they just, they become so kind of emotionless that they become indolent, whereas the bodhisattva is full of vigor and full of energy to help others. And that's a big difference between the two paths. So, all right, everybody, that's going to conclude tonight's talk about uh, the bodhisattva's guide to a harmonious relationship. So, hope you enjoyed it. Yay. Excellent. Yay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Michael. Oh, wow. Beautiful. Thanks. Thanks for the comments. Thank you, Noam. Everybody, I appreciate yeah. it so much. Hey, do you want to make any announcements? Um, yeah, just to let everybody know uh, that I have a few new classes of my own coming up that I offer through my own uh, little website world. And you can go to lotus un lotusunderground.com uh, to find out there's three classes coming up in a late March, early April. Uh, one is a beginner's course that just is a survey of the different types of Buddhism. So if you just want a historical survey of all the different kinds of Buddhism, where they came from and where they are in the world today, 
That's a, a class I call the Irreversible Wheel. Um, my That's, again, a beginner course. And then I have two slightly more advanced courses, one on Vajrayana Buddhism, the, the so-called third turning of the Dharma Wheel, the most kind of advanced school of Buddhism, uh, basically Tibetan Buddhism in that way. Uh, and then I have one more course, which is a sutra study course on the Pranya Paramita Sutra in 8,000 lines. It's kind of like the mother of all Pranya Paramita Sutras. It's like the mother of the Heart Sutra and Vajra Sutra. So I'm going to do an eight-week course on that. And you can find out the dates and how to register and all of that at the website. So.